Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Darien Library this evening. We are really lucky to have Howard Czar, the Lyndhurst Executive Director with us this evening to provide an overview of the Lyndhurst Mansion in Terrytown, New York, its 67 acre estate and 15 outbuildings. In addition to highlighting the main rooms of the mansion and important works from its 10,000 piece collection, Czar will discuss the recent renovations to the garden originally designed in the 1860s, influenced by the building of, the, of Central Park, including footpaths, benches, rock formations, and landscape features. Czar will also highlight the restoration of major outbuildings, including the bowling alley, the swimming pool building, and laundry building. Before we begin, I would like to thank the friends of the library who make these programs possible. We would also welcome your questions at the end of the program. Just type them into the Q&A tab and we will make sure we uh, get to them and answer everyone's questions. Um, I hope you're all ready for a wonderful tour. This is just lovely for them to do this for us and sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Great. Uh, Kathleen, thank you so much for the introduction. What I'm going to do is take my face off the screen and switch to my um, presentation here. Um, so thank you everybody for joining. I'm going to do a few things this evening. I'm going to um, talk about the Lindhurst mansion itself, as Catherine indicated. Then I'm going to go to some of the landscape that we've recently re restored and many of the outbuildings. And then one of the other things that I'm actually going to do is focus a little bit on the story of uh, Lindhurst collections through the women of uh, one of the estates where really since its beginnings, it has had a significant leadership and even ownership by women. We, we, we're reassessing these days um, our history. And one of the things that we're always able to do at Lindhurst is show that it was more diverse and broader than uh, we oftentimes think. There we go. Um, so just a little bit about uh, Lindhurst. It's really considered one of the most seminal houses in the United States of the 19th century. It's where we transition from uh, classical architecture to romantic architecture. So think of that as the architecture of the Revolutionary War, those Monticello brick center hall rectilinear buildings into uh, buildings that were essentially very um, freeform and very, um, you know, romantic looking. And in some ways, this picture really says what we often say about Lyndhurst that, you know, the, the adage of Mount's home is castle really actually starts at Lyndhurst in uh, the United States. Um, it was designed by a gentleman named Alexander Jackson Davis, who um, was really the first star architect in the United States. And he really is the Frank Lloyd Wright of his time, designing not only the buildings, but where they're placed, the exterior the interiors and the furnishings. Um, and as many people say, um, Monticello is the most important building to the United States of the 18th century, Lyndhurst of the 19th century, and Frank Lloyd Wright's Fall in Water of the 20th century. So it really does have that level of significance to it. Um, here you can see what the building originally looked like when it was first built. It was about half of the size of what you just saw, and it was uh, built as a uh, country villa between 1838 and 1842, when really uh, the south was the wealthy part of the country, not the north. Um, it is uh, considered the full, first fully realized Gothic revival Victorian house in the country at a point at which the um, Greek revival style was the dominant style. Uh, Greek revival is that style that you can associate with things like, you know, the South Terra, all those Southern plantation mansions with the big columns uh, around them and the pediment at the top. And that style really stayed in style till the very beginning of uh, the Civil War in the 1860s. Um, the estate was built on the Hudson uh, next to the house of author Washington Irving. And it was a retreat from New York City after an early 1830s uh, cholera epidemic when half of New York City fled New York and fled the epidemic to get fresh air in the country. So some things that, you know, go around, come around. Uh, we think everything is new, but this has happened four centuries before. 
Um, it was built by a former New York City mayor, but it was with his wife's money that it was erected. Um, and the landscape of Lyndhurst, the early landscape was probably designed by the architect, Andrew Jackson Day, Alexander Jackson Davis, and is likely his only surviving landscape uh, scheme in the country. Um, now, this shows the drawings uh, that are in the Met of the house when it was doubled in size uh, between 1864 and 1868. And unusually, uh, Davis, the original architect, comes back to do um, the, um, the doubling of the house. Um, Davis also designs about 50 pieces of furniture for the house between its first iteration and second. Um, and because the house was always sold as a country house, um, it was, you know, even though it's 23 miles from New York City, it was just considered so far away that to have to move the furnishings was very difficult. Um, luckily for us, we have probably between 80 and 90 percent of the furnishings of the house from when the family first moved in in 1842 till the last donor gave it in 1961. And because the first photographs were taken in 1868, we also really have a very good idea of where everything was in the house and where that changed over time. Um, and so, you know, when you're in the house, you're actually seeing a decorative scheme backed by a photograph by one of the owners. And we do actually have 10,000 pieces in the collection, uh, including a lot of pieces added by Jay Gould, who buys it in 1880, and by his descendants who own it until it's turned into a museum in 1965. Um, the house was widely photographed. There were stereo views made, postcards, which you're seeing here, uh, and magazine layouts documenting the house. So it's really something that we can that we know extremely well uh, where things were, uh, even to the point where uh, two films in 1971 and 72, two Dark Shadows films were made in the house when it was an early museum. And that even shows us where things were placed uh, at that time as well. So we still have the original 67 acres of um, the original plot. It's on the widest part of the Lower Hudson River. There are 15 outbuildings, including a four-part carriage house, two gatehouses, a bowling alley, a laundry building, a dog kennel, and some of you may have seen us at the Westminster Dog Show this past summer. Um, a children's playhouse, a swimming pool building, uh, the greenhouse of which the frame is left, and the greenhouse services building. And from the top of the Tower of the Mansion, you can actually see um, New York City down the river. Um, so let's go through the uh, interiors of the house. Um, we're actually looking at um, rooms that reflect um, the specific owners from the 1840s through the 1960s. Um, this is Lindhurst Parlors. Um, it's actually um, the only room in the house that's done based on death inventories that predates photography in the United States. And so this is the one that's a little bit of a conjecture. Um, but um, we believe this is the furniture by Davis that was originally in this room. As far as we can tell, it's the earliest furniture we actually have. There are drawings that still exist, both at Columbia University and the Metropolitan Museum uh, for some of the pieces that are in this room. So we can tell which ones are the earlier pieces and which ones are the later pieces. Um, and we actually own three different parlor suites of all the families that own the house. And we actually have an exhibition um, right now that is called Three Parlors, which shows how American uh, cultural taste uh, changed during the 19th century um, as the country became wealthier and more secure. Um, here's uh, pictures of some of the pieces from uh, the second owners from the 1860s. Um, you can see a very large uh, sculpture to the right by an Italian sculptor named Benzoni uh, that was purchased out of the Crystal Palace exhibition for the house. Um, interestingly, this living room furniture from the second owner was donated uh, or was given as a gift by the third owner, Jay Gould, to his sister uh, because he puts his own furniture in. Uh, so we think she probably gets it at some point in the late 1880s. Her uh, descendants donated back to us 
in the 1990s. So when you look at the love seat and the chair to its left, you can see that one has a very 1960s kind of striped chanton silk um, upholstery and the, the other piece has a Victorian red mohair upholstery because uh, different family members got different pieces over time and they upholstered them um, very differently. Uh, we recently realized that the sofa from the suite was actually in uh, one of the attics of the building in a corner and it was severely broken and covered with dust. Um, we're having it restored, but we, we suspect that even before Jay Gould in the 1880s gave this suite to his sister, um, the piece was already broken. And so for the first time in, in probably more than 100 years, uh, it will be restored to its full uh, splendor. Um, here you can see pieces uh, that were uh, designed by the Herder brothers, who were the major furniture designers um, in uh, the United States in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, the Lockwood Ma Matthews Mansion in Connecticut is one of their um, great achievements. Um, and this was one of the Herder brothers' last commissions uh, before uh, the younger Herder brother died. Uh, the largest piece from the suite is actually on extended loan to the Metropolitan Museum in their American Decorative Arts uh, wing. Uh, now looking at some of the rooms, uh, the other rooms of the house, one of the grandest is um, the, the great uh, grand picture gallery at Lindhurst. This is on the second floor of the house. Um, we have the bulk of Jay Gould's academic French and continental paintings uh, that were purchased from uh, Nodler Gallery and includes pieces by such artists as Courbet, Jerome, Bouguereau, Corot, uh, Tiffany among the Americans, um, and many of the Barbizon uh, school landscape painters. Uh, the window that you're looking at at the end of the room is a very early work uh, by Louis Comfort Tiffany, probably designed around 1882. Uh, Tiffany's family uh, summered in Irvington and Lindhurst actually was originally in Irvington. The boundary changed to Terrytown uh, around 1900, but they were neighbors and the Goulds and the Tiffany's went to uh, the St. Presbyterian Church together. And we believe that when uh, Tiffany was starting out as a decorator that the uh, Goulds hired him to redo many of the windows in the house. Here's a picture of that same room from the Minstrels Gallery up above to give you a slightly different perspective on it. Another significant room at Lindhurst is uh, the dining room. This is the largest room added in the 1864 to 1868 um, uh, addition to the house. And really, if you want to think of what wealth looks like in the United States um, at the time of the Civil War, as wealth is switching from the South to the North, this really is one of the few rooms in the United States where you can get it. And it's really quite complete. Um, it's, it's, it's heavily faux painted, um, which you'll see when you get there, only the mantelpiece is is actual marble and everything else in this room is faux painted. Um, and the other thing to notice is you can see the stained glass windows there by a gentleman named Gibson, who is an American and who was responsible for doing the stained glass and the Capitol building. So we're very lucky and it's unusual that, that all our stained glass from the 1830s on is done by Americans rather than, uh, than typically stained glass came from Germany at the time. Um, here's a you know, uh, the, of the main bedroom for the lady of the house. And as I had mentioned before, we have all these pictures from when the family moved in in 1868. And here you go, this is what, um, you know, it looks like today. Um, it, interestingly, this was one of the rooms where we didn't have the, we had all the chairs and the small pieces of furniture and the decorations. We didn't have the large pieces because we think that when Helen Gould, who was the um, fourth owner, had it, she gave this furniture to her daughter as a wedding present. Um, but the other thing that's interesting about that is when Helen Gould got the house for her father, she didn't move into her mother's bedroom. She moved into her father's bedroom, which was smaller because to her, it wasn't about gender. It was about the ownership. So her father was the owner. He lived in the smaller bedroom. That's the bedroom that she moved into. Now let's move a little bit to the landscape as well. Lindhurst has 
um, a very extensive landscape. And this is a map from 1870 that was published to sell the property around 1873. Um, and what is useful about this map, as you look at it, you can see some of the trees are thicker um, and greener and others are little small dots all over the map. And what this luckily does is the thick, it's essentially drawn to the size of the trees. What this does is tells us what was planted in the 1840s and what was planted in the 1860s. And that's how we know that um, from the 1840s, what uh, Alexander Jackson Davis did when he designed the house. And one of the most significant things that he does, you'll notice there's a band of trees at the very front over the water. And you'd think, why would you plant trees in front of your water view? Well, in those days, the water really was, you know, that was the super highway and that was the industrial transportation of the boats. And also they knew that the train was coming. Uh, along there. And so they raised up their their uh, land and planted trees to screen the train. And that train is still uh, basically there. Uh, the landscape scheme is generally gardenesque into picture or picturesque into gardenesque rather. So when you say picturesque, it really means creating pictures with trees, since you would either walk, ride a horse or ride a carriage through of the landscape, it was done to really give you a uh, unfolding panoply of different tree types, colors, sizes, shapes. Um, before you had television, that was considered entertainment, essentially. Um, one of the other things about the Lindhurst landscape, it never was fully redone. It was added to, different plants were placed and some went away, but it really essentially is what starts in 1840. 42 and goes through the 1960s when the last donor donates it. Um, so let's look at some of the specific elements that we've restored recently. You're looking at a fountain and marble seating group that's in front of the mansion. Um, this was something that Helen Gould put in in the 1890s when having marble furniture uh, became fashionable and she would have seen it in Newport. Um, the furniture was removed in the 70s from the estate because it wasn't considered early and it wasn't considered American. It was luckily in the basement of the greenhouse, so we were able to generally put it back. Um, the fountain that was there was uh, a famous fountain called the Money's Pan. For those of you who watched the, um, the, the lecture on the mount, they may have shown um, one of those fountains, which is in their entry. They had the three foot version, we had two four foot versions, which are very rare. There's one five foot version, which was the original. Um, we weren't able to acquire one. So somebody gave us another McMoney's fountain, which we hear the duck. Uh, but recently um, we actually found one in Chicago um, for the first time in uh, 13 years one came up for auction and we were able to buy it so in the next couple of years that one will go back into the original basin which we still have and that was in front of the greenhouse which is where it will return. Um, this is the 1894 bowling alley this was built by Helen Gould. Um, Helen built a bowling alley because bowling was something that men and women could play together equally um, and she wanted that level of equality as the state owner. Um, this building was really derelict until about four or five years ago when we restored it uh, completely. The back had fallen in, the stairs were off, it was surrounded by chain link fence. And here's what it looks like in its restored state today. Um, this is the interior. The lanes are the first regulation length in the United States. Then I sell it to Helen Gould. He didn't believe a woman could pay her bills. So she had to go to a male intermediary who bought it. Um, and I don't know if you can see, but in the left, you can see people pressing their noses against the window. The great thing about this bowling alley is it's all windows. It's along the river. So in the summer, it would be very cool. And if you're there and the bowling alley is not open for touring, you still basically can look in and really see the building and get a good sense of what it was like. Another element that Helen Gould added is the Rose Garden, and this was added around uh, World War I. Um, originally, all the roses were in shades of pink, so there were no reds uh, in there and there were no whites. It was all sort of, you know, palest pinks to shell deep shell corals. 
Um, Helen Gould was actually a dedicated horticulturalist, a naturalist, a birder, and an animal lover. Um, her father grew up in the Catskill Mountains um, with the noted naturalist at the time, John Burroughs. They were the classmates in, in grade school together, and Helen stayed in contact with him. And, you know, she was not a socialite gardener. She was a very serious, she did grow roses clearly, but she was a very serious horticulturalist and gave first time guests of the house a book on American horticulture. Uh, directly across from the roses were perennial beds, which you see pictured here. And this is a fountain that was copied from one in the Bubbly Gardens. We have about half of the fountain um, and we're looking to restore the perennial beds and the fountain um, itself. Um, basically, we uh, a few years ago found a colored film from 1942 um, that is all of the, it's 35 minutes of the outside. And it shows us not only what these black and whites show us, but it shows us exactly which colors the flowers were. Uh, we've also discovered that this fountain, uh, the same places in Florence on the Arno that made them for the grand tour in the 19th century still make them and you can send them the size of your fountain and they'll reproduce one for you. Um, Lidhurst was used very heavily during World War II for military convalescence, and here we have one of the soldiers um, saluting Diana and the elders in that fountain. Um, another part of the estate that we've just restored um, is a suite of uh, a pathway that goes from the bench and veranda all the way down to the bowling alley at the riverside, going through a series of three uh, planted um, rockeries. This landscape was done in the 1860s and it was heavily influenced by Central Park. Um, here's a, a picture of the rockery in um, the, you know, 1868 and it may be hard to stand, but if you look up to the very right in the bench, you will see the photographer seated with his watch in his hand, timing the exposure of um, the photograph. So, this is essentially when I got to Lidhurst eight years ago, kind of what you saw in the area. The pass and the rocks were all there, and this is now what it looks like um, uh, today. Um, so when you come, you can basically see all the uh, of the rockery, all the lovely benches, all the trees, and look, sit and enjoy the view of the river. Um, Helen Gould also built a swimming pool at Lidhurst for a growing family. This is what it looked like, uh, you know, around World War One when she built it, um, and it fell into re disrepair. But we've recently stabilized it, so again, you can see what it looks like at this point. And um, you know, we had a contemporary art exhibit in there, which uh, has unfortunately just closed. Um, but if you take one of our upper landscape tours, you can actually. Um, go into the building and it's not restored, but it is stabilized and get a sense of what it's like. So this is what it was like in its heyday. You'll notice that the lifeguard is in the boat, in the pool, the different palm trees that you're looking at between each of the columns um, basically, uh, you know, came from the Lindhurst uh, greenhouses. So I'm going to turn a little bit now to the um, the women who own Lindhurst. So we'll start with the full ownership. So you'll see uh, the first owners, the first three are men, the last two are women. So, uh, and it's in three, William Paulding, um, a former mayor of New York City, uh, George Merritt, not the Parkway Merritts, um, uh, and then Jay Gould, the railroad baron, his eldest daughter, Helen Gould, and his youngest daughter, Anna Gould, the Duchess of Tallarat. Now, when we replace this with the women, we don't have um, a photograph of Mrs. Paulding, uh, who was Maria Rhinelander, but we have images of everybody uh, else, uh, the women who really for quite a bit of the time were the ones who um, you know, oversaw the house. So let's start with uh, Maria Rhinelander. She was a sign of the, one of the old Dutch families of New York. Um, for those of you who have read Edith Wharton, you're very familiar with the sense of these Dutch families who had been in New York since the 17th and 18th century. And even in the 19th century, the money really was changing to Wall Street money. They were still considered the sort of old scions of society. Um, what people don't know is their fortunes really came from the early involvement in the triangle trade. They either owned 
were invested in the, the ships that brought the enslaved to the United States and then take, took goods from the Caribbean back to um, the continent. So um, in New York in particular, the um, Livingston family, which is one of the, the, the lead families in the center of the constitution, were not just investors, they actually were actively involved in the slave trade and married into um, uh, many families in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, in a twist of convention, she really provides uh, the funds for her for the building, um, and it's her husband and son who designed the mansion. Um, it's interesting because in some ways, Gothic revival was considered very male, and so it was often used for the men's library, not for the whole house. So it's interesting here. She said, okay, I'll give you the money. They went off and did the design, and usually it was the reverse. Second owner is Julia Merritt. Her basically found, um, uh, invented rather, a the spring that went in the seat of uh, railroad cars um, as the shock absorber. And railroads in the 19th century were what tech is today. It was the industry in which the huge money was made and he was immensely wealthy. But um, you know, he buys the house in 1864, moves in 1868, dies in 1873. So she manages it for seven years till it's finally sold um, to the Gould. So you know, in some ways, she really, you know, is almost uh, you know as long the the owner of the house as her husband was. Um, this is a portrait of Mrs. J. Gould, also a Helen Gould. Um, she is really the one time uh, where uh, the wife of, in the family is the supporting player. She was upper middle class. She was nice family, mother, domestic, religious. She kept the household accounts. And what's interesting is even though we have two massive portraits of um, Jay Gould, one by an important painter and one by a society painter. We only have the small watercolor of Mrs. Gould. Um, her eldest daughter, who was the fourth owner, was um, Helen Gould. Helen was considered plain, plump, and not interested in society. She attends NYU Law School, um, and she doesn't get married until she's 43. Uh, basically, for a long time, we were trying to figure out if we could find her uh, law school diploma. And then what somebody explained to us was women were allowed to attend NYU law school. It was one of the few places they could. And she did it so she could keep uh, tabs on her father's business. She was the executor of the estate. But you didn't need a law degree because a woman, there was no way for her in that time to practice law. Uh, but, you know, she was a very, um, she repairs her father's uh, reputation. She's kind of a precursor of Eleanor Roosevelt. She's probably perhaps the most famous philanthropist in the United States. And she's, for being a very deferential traditional woman, um, she's very astute. Um, and she's really a great collector, because we'll go through a few of the things that she had and some of which are in the letters collection. She had a really, she had an eye for quality. Um, she was a proper church lady. She went to both Episcopal and Presbyterian churches on Sunday. So nothing was done in excess, but she wanted good quality. And she always buys, it's almost like trophy purchases. If something is covered in the newspapers, that's what she'll buy. And although not well known today, she was one of the most significant collectors and commissioners of top works from Louis Comfort Tiffany, her name. Um, so this is a dress um, by uh, M.A. Conley, uh, copied or licensed likely from a worth example in France to be made in the United States. It was a dress for her coming out year when she was 18. It's in the collection of the Museum of City of New York. We don't have that dress, but we do have this dress, um, which is by somebody named Redfern. Redfern was between Worth and Chanel. The Americans really didn't buy them. The French aristocrats did. And her sister at that time was living in France. So Helen has a lot of dresses uh, from Redfern. And it may not look that way today, but when you look at this dress, you really couldn't do much more than really stand and stand 
look low. This dress was considered very tailored. It had tailored sleeves. It didn't have the frou-frou. It was cut closer to the body. And the idea of this was at a time in the 1880s, 90s, and 1900, when women were moving out of the home and into society, they needed something that they could actually wear and move around and be comfortable in. Um, this is a picture of Helen Gould's mansion, the one she inherits from her father in Fifth Avenue. She adds in this Tiffany uh, window, this figural window, which is considered Tiffany's finest figural window and is actually now in a collection in uh, San Francisco. Um, she also buys his best glass vase, which you see on the left and above, that sold uh, about 10 years ago for about $500,000. We don't have that, but we do have the vase on the right, which is a Tiffany enameled vase. They're incredibly rare. This is likely the largest one uh, that is known. She also commissioned Louis Comfort Tiffany to do uh, memorial windows at a church in the Catskill for her father. Um, this is the Tiffany watercolor uh, for that window, which is in our collection. This is actually what the real windows look like when you go to see them in Roxbury. And nearby to Lyndhurst, if you come on a Monday through Friday, you can go to the town hall in uh, Irvington where the Tiffany library room that Helen Gould donated to the town is located and fully restored. And it's a really wonderful um, thing to see. It's unusual for Tiffany. It's almost, um, it's you know getting later in his career around the time that he retires. And it's almost uh, European Jugendstil in its style. Helen also commissions uh, Stanford White of McKinney White to build the NYU Library and the Hall of Fame in the Bronx. Um, and it's considered uh, uh, Stanford White's best building. And that's another building in which she brings Tiffany in to um, do the work. Now, the state then passed when Helen died in 1938. Her youngest sister uh, buys it. She marries not one, but two French aristocrats. The first one, uh, Bonnie de Castellan, does not have money. She was not married off by her family to French aristocrats. She actually was engaged to an American, goes to France to be finished, meets Bonnie de Castellan there, and he ultimately is a, becomes the model for the Duke de Guermont in uh, Proust Swan's way. Um, he cheats on her, she divorces him, throws him out. And because of the way her father set up uh, the income for their daughters, he treated the daughters and the sons equally. She maintains her fortune or independence. Um, she marries his cousin, the Duke of Talleyrand. Uh, her, I think it's her grandfather-in-law sells the Louisiana Purchase uh, to the United States. Um, and when she comes back to the United States in 1939, uh, she was the Duchess of Terrytown, um, and she spends a lot of time create, recreating her uh, French life, shops quite a bit. Um, and she's very, she's willful and individualistic, but I think in many ways like a model for women today, she, she actually has a very good sense of what she'd like to do. Um, and does it, uh, basically. Um, you know, and she lived most of her life as a French aristocrat and her adult life and got very used to shopping at Cartier and Van Cleef and things like that. Um, and, you know, she really tries to redo this in the United States. Unfortunately, her husband really was the one who had the great taste for major antiques. She's more of a shopper and a lot of times it's quality, not quantity. So when you look at Lindhurst, it really becomes a repository for uh, the furniture that she shops uh, for. So in the um, lower right hand corner of the picture, you can see some of those Herder Brothers uh, pieces from 1867 that she redoes, but the rest of it is crammed with furniture that um, she buys, and we know uh, one of the uh, one of the um, sort of sons, the, one of her or rather nephews, when Anna was still alive, got married. And he tells us that he had to take his bride to be up to meet Anna because she was the eldest living old. And she just said, "Oh yeah, go to the house and you know pick out two or three things that you'd like because it was just chock a block with things and those could be your wedding presents and you know she she really used it as a storehouse and was really lived at the plaza and was there really only a month a year 
Um, what you're looking at here is something we acquired a few years ago at a Christie sale in Paris. Um, this was the, the Tiffany & Company watch that Anna had made for her marriage. The front has Bonny de Castellon's coat of arms in enamel. The back has her um, image um, in a technique that Tiffany uh, and company doesn't know. They lost the formula for how it was done. They really don't know how, uh, how they made it. They have no clue. No. Um, here's some examples of the work that Anna commissioned from Cartier and Van Cleef. Um, when we talked to the archivist at Van Cleef, I think they had something like, a, you know, sort of uh, 60 uh, watercolors of things that she specifically commissioned from them. On the lower left, you'll see a little, you know, sort of clutch from the Roaring Twenties that was made by Cartier. It was essentially, they started making things like this because there's a little jeweled clasp and it just gave more excuses of where you could put uh, jewelry. And that we also purchased at Christie's for our collection at Linters. Um, here's a painting uh, by um, Bouguereau that Anna acquires. We had one that her father bought uh, in the 1880s. This is one from 1902, and it's uh, Anna trying to recreate her French life of the Goulds as uh, Presbyterians would not have had, you know, a painting of the Madonna and child quite uh, this Catholic in sentiment, but Anna, who's lived in, in France her whole life, even though she was not Catholic, um, felt very comfortable with this type of painting. Um, additionally, Anna, um, uh, one of the things we have in our collection, which is something, again, we recently reacquired, um, is a um, flapper dress from the 20s. And Anna was probably well into her 50s when she wore this dress, which you may not think. And Anna was very short and pear-shaped, um, but she liked to dress very young and uh, coquettishly. Um, a number of years ago, when we did an exhibition, we borrowed uh, dresses of hers from the Palais Galeria, the French Fashion Museum. Um, the curator there um, basically explained to us that to fit into um, Chanel fashions, you either had to be a twig or a barrel. You basically had to be straight up and down regardless of what your shape was. And Anna was definitely not that. She was very pear-shaped. And this dress is by Agnès, who was one of her favorite couturiers, who's not the best known and not the most fashionable of couturiers. And what the, the curator from Paris explained to us is, you know, Chanel was already famous at that time. And I think she probably looked at Anna's like, you know, I don't, I don't know what to do with you. And I don't, I have many more Americans who are, who are buying loads of dresses from me. And she probably didn't get the, the treatment that she felt she deserved from Chanel. So she went to some of these um, secondary uh, couturiers like, uh, uh, like Agnès and Jerome, who's also someone that we own dresses from. Uh, where she was treated as the star that she uh, wanted to be um, seen. And you can see a number of these dresses that I've shown. We have right now an exhibit called Three Parlors in our exhibition gallery, which will be open for another month. Um, and many of these uh, pieces are on view in that exhibition gallery from the collection. Usually they're in storage. So I think one of the things that I'm going to end with is why we don't really remember the ghouls that well, and particularly the women. And this is a challenge today as we look at history and see who is included and who gets remembered and why. Um, you know, Helen Gould was uh, the leading philanthropist of her time, covered front page across the country. Um, she was very well loved. Um, Anna Gould was the leading socialite and one of the wealthiest women in the world. The reason that Lyndhurst was preserved is because when Robert Moses in New York was trying to build the Tappan Zee Bridge at the time, he was going to take Lyndhurst through eminent domain and build the bridge. Anna was so wealthy, she bought the waterland in front of Lyndhurst and the, the property on either side because you, can take, you cannot take water land through eminent domain and that's how she protected it, her house from being uh, torn down. Um, so these two women were very well known at the time. Um, but one of the things that happened is a little bit the social stigma of their father, Jay was a little bit visited on the children. So 
Um, Jay Gould was the first, you know, sort of, he was known as a railroad baron, but he was really um, the first master of the universe on Wall Street. He really more got companies through um, stock manipulation than he actually built them from the ground up. So the Vanderbilts, whose railroad ran in front of Lindhurst, they built the railroads. They had built shipping lines before that, um, you know, sort of Jay Gould, basically through by hook or by crook, got railroads through stock manipulation. Um, and for those of you, again, who have read Edith Wharton, you sort of know that if somebody manipulates stock and causes bankruptcy um, to other people or goes bankrupt himself, causes loss to other society members, they're supposed to disappear from society and not be seen. And so Jay Gould was not received in a fashionable society. And this was held against him and oftentimes uh, held against his children. And to a certain extent, unlike families like the Rockefellers that still have a major association today and still meet on a biennial basis at the, you know, the ancestral home Kaikit in Westchester, the Gould children didn't really associate as a unit and they sort of went their own separate ways. Um, and another big thing is the Gould fortune really only lasted till the children's generation by and large. Most of the other people, they either, certain of the, the Jay Gould's children didn't have children of their own. Um, the, they married into other dynasties or they spent every cent that they had. And one of the things that you oftentimes see is that it's the men who do things like, you know, Duke University, Brown University, Vanderbilt University, um, the Whitney Museum, that wasn't a man in that case, but a lot of times institute Rockefeller Center, a lot of institutions and their names are what perpetuate our knowledge of those families. Um, Jay Gould in, in many ways was a private philanthropist. He knew that people hated him and he didn't want to try to whitewash his reputation. So he gave money privately and likely NYU should be called Gould University because they were the largest donors to NYU at a time when it wasn't a major university and it struggled, but they gave the money anonymously and didn't ask for it to be named after them. So sadly there is, is no major institution that people can point to named after the gold. So a little bit, that's probably affected the women of the family the most, and they're really uh, very much forgotten today. So again, that is the end of my presentation. I believe at this point, uh, Kathleen, uh, if people want, they can um, ask questions and I'd be happy to answer whatever anybody has. Um. Just where am I here? This is, uh, there I am. Um, let's see. Um, let me get my thing here. I would, I would love for you just to talk a little bit about your holiday tours because I'm sure people will be interested in hearing about that when, as we were speaking sure. before this program. So Lindhurst is open to the public. Uh, we have a website, you, you're encouraged to buy your tickets in advance. That's probably the best way because we do sell out generally speaking. Um, you, it's also a very robust website, so you really get a good sense of what you're looking at, much more than I was able to present uh, to you today. Um, we have two separate uh, suites of tours, so during October, um, we're, we're decorated for uh, fall and Halloween, and many people come uh, during leaf peeping season to see Lindhurst, it's probably our busiest season. Then right before Black Friday weekend, we'll reopen with Christmas decorations uh, and you're welcome to come to those. And we will have, we hope that everything holds out. Um, so also go to our website because we have a Sherlock Holmes drama series in the mansion, sort of starting in mid-November where the play is performed in the mansion. And then starting in early December, we switch to a Dickens performance in uh, the mansion. Um, one other thing to add about uh, the Halloween season, we have both daytime um, tours of the mansion and evening candlelit tours of the mansion. And if you have young children, we don't recommend at this point necessarily taking the tours because you do have to show a, a, a COVID test for any kids under 12, but you don't have to do that if you tour the outside. And we have 
um, skeletons and Halloween themed things and a series of mirrors set up on the landscape. So two seasons worth of tours coming up that we hope you can all participate in. That sounds lovely. Um, people asked me this afternoon, is there mass transit to get to Lyndhurst? Um, yeah, it depends where you're coming from. We're very easy for a lot of ways. In many ways, coming from Connecticut is, is probably easier than a lot of parts of Westchester because if you get on the cross Westchester, we're right on the river, right before you get on the Mario Cuomo Bridge. It's the last exit and it's like five minutes from, or, you know, at the most two stoplights from the exit. If you're coming from New York City, um, there are Metro North trains to Terrytown. And if you take an express, it's 35 minutes. And then from the train station, there are always cabs you can call an Uber from them and have them take you to the house. So those are the easiest uh, ways to uh, get to us generally. Sounds easy. Um, also, before we started the program, we spoke a little bit about the craft show. Would you tell people about that? Yeah, so Lindhurst has had, we have a full season of tentpole activities at Lindhurst. Um, and I'll, I'll just run through all of them. So April, we typically start first weekend of April, our large flower show where the mansion is flowers take over the four, uh, floors take over the 14 rooms and decorate. We have uh, florists, we have an antique show at the same time. Uh, one of the major auctioneers brings uh, floral gemstone jewelry that people can try on. We have contemporary artists that are part of that and workshops for adults and kids. Um, in May, we have the first of our biannual craft shows. It's generally the first weekend after Mother's Day. It's typically about 10,000 people come and it's about 200 vendors uh, or actually 300 vendors. It's a big craft show. It's been going on for 35 years. Um, June, we typically have one of our outdoor events, particularly our um, Rose Weekend and um, other uh, events around uh, our landscape. July and August, Thursday nights for two months, we have jazz on the Bowling Alley Hill lawn. Um, and we usually get between 600 and 1,000 people. And it's a great place for families because you know, the kids can run around without worry of traffic. Again, September, sort of generally right after Labor, first weekend after Labor Day, we have the second of the craft shows. Then October, we have all of Halloween, November into December, all of uh, Christmas. So we have a lot of activities like that. And then interspersed, there's various theatrical performances in the, the mansion as well. Wow, that's amazing. That's quite yeah. a, a program. Um, how many volunteers do you have at Lynnhurst? You know, we're not really volunteer driven um, like many places. Um, we do actually pay our docents and our, our staff. Um, so we have donors and board supporters and advisors, but um, we've basically decided that for that level of work, we should at least try to pay our people mm -hmm. something. I would just say we don't quite have Jay Gould's resources. Mm -hmm. And so we don't probably have his level of staff. Um, you know, so um, donations are always appreciated. I think every cultural institution, you know, feels that way. Does the Gould family still underwrite you in any way? You know, there are still members of the Gould family around there. Um, uh, they are a little dispersed. Um, and like I said, their fortune went away. So it's really more the fortunes or the, the money that they have. But we do have uh, Gould members on our board. We do have people who uh, come up. We, uh, I would say most notably, we continue to get donations from the Gould family. So one of the examples is last year, one of the Gould descendants gave us a very fancy photo album, family, you know, sort of professionally produced photo album. And it had one of the first pictures that we've had of the interior of the children's playhouse because we knew what it looked like on the outside. We had lots of pictures of that. We didn't know what it looked like on the inside. And we realized that a number of pieces of wicker furniture that we had in collection storage were those in the photos that were meant to be in the children's playhouse. So we were able to virtually repopulate the children's playhouse with that furniture based on this photo album that we were given by um, 
Gould family member. One of the things that's coming on extended loan to us from a Gould family member is Helen Gould donated, she underwrote a lot of the Spanish American War um, <laughs> and was given gifts by different members of the military. And I think the army gave her a gold miniature cot, which was the cot, which was shaped like the cot that the soldiers in the Spanish American War slept in. And the family still has it. And so they're going to give it to us for extended loan uh, to put in the picture gallery. So I would say in particular, it's not just uh, financial, it really is the support that they've given us um, of returning things to us that they had from their family. The Merritt family, the second owners, also have been giving us quite a bit of stuff recently. So that portrait that I showed you of Julia Merritt, we mm -hmm. just got that portrait and the portrait of her husband back um, right before the pandemic. Um, they also have recently given us um, morning picture embroideries, hair wreaths for the family, um, drawings of family members from the mid 19th century. Um, they gave us the family um, crib that they had gotten. Um, so really a lot of the, it's surprising how many people are out there, even from the Paulding family, we didn't get it directly from the Paulding's, but those of you who are closer to my age may remember uh, the American Olympic figure skater, Dick Button. Mm -hmm. He got a Paulding family Chinese export bowl from one of the descendants and he donated it to us. So it is, it's quite surprising how many of these things related to Lindhurst have come back to us um, quite recently when you would think this stuff would all either be gone or dispersed yeah. or unidentified. That's good, that's where it belongs. I have yeah. a question from someone. It says, you mentioned the discovery of color film. Is the footage on display? Um, it, it is from time to time. Um, we sometimes have it showing in, we don't right now. Uh, I think next year we will have it back. Part of, a little bit of the challenge this year is we cut down on some of our film until it was clear what the impact of COVID was. We didn't want to encourage people to you know, stand right next to each other and watch this film. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the past, it was in our visitor center um, along, you know, you'd see the, the intro film to uh, Lindhurst on one wall and that film would show on another wall. Um, and it is kind of, it's kind of amazing that it's very early color film and you see the flowers in the greenhouse before the greenhouse was decommissioned for a Red Cross sale. You see the plants on the estate and you sort of realize that you're still basically walking in the same yeah. landscape in the same place. That's amazing. Um, I have a question from a viewer. With the restoration of the swimming, oh, with the restoration of the swimming building, is there water in the pool now? <laughs> no, it, we have done a, I would describe as a stabilization at this point. That is the one building on the property that we really, the, the bowling alley we fully restored and, you know, looks like the ghouls are ready to come down and drink lemonade in it. The, the swimming pool building was really in terrible shape. So we've done a lot of that work that people don't see, like rewiring the electrical work, redoing you know, major parts of the roof, the, the support of the floor and the entry area was in really bad shape. My suspicion is we will get the, when you enter the swimming pool building, there is a front building that has a main saloon with a boys and girls um, changing rooms to either side, and then you enter the the actual sort of you know Roman baths uh, that hold the pool. Those are stabilized, cleaned, and you really get a good sense of what that's like, and they're well lit. But that is not restored, and that will take us a much longer time to do. Yeah. Um, what are your plans for the greenhouse? You know, the greenhouse was built by Lord and Bill Burnham. And for those of you who know greenhouses, they are the premier greenhouse manufacturer in the Northeast in the United States and really in other parts of the country. Uh, three months after Jay Gould buys the house in 1880, the wood greenhouse that is there burns down. 
And Lord and Burnham were two separate companies. One made the greenhouses, one made the boilers. And one of their factories had burned down in Syracuse. And basically Jay Gould says, I'll build you a factory in Irvington <laughs> if you come down and rebuild my greenhouse in, in cast iron and wood. And it's a little apocryphal. We've never really researched it. But supposedly when it was built in 1880, it was the largest um, cast iron structure in the world and like only to be superseded when Eiffel starts building Eiffel Tower and department stores out of cast iron in, uh, you know, in uh, Paris. Whether that's true or not, it's, it's a big building. And I think we just received a major donation and I think it'll take us a good five years. We won't fully restore the greenhouse to that donation. We think we will fully stabilize it, fully paint it, um, do restorations to the door fronts of each of the sections and try to figure out some tenting um, underneath at least the main area where the main fountain is uh, to be able to use it more as an event space and a, a space for visitors to enjoy. The challenge for us with the greenhouses, and this is true of the New York Botanical Garden, their Lord and Burnham greenhouse is about 1918. It's much later than ours. Um, it was restored first in the 1980s and literally every 10 years they have to close it down and spend 10 to $20 million to wow. re-restore it because greenhouses basically pump humidity into a, a metal and wood building. So you're basically mm -hmm. rotting your building from the inside. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, it's a, I would say, you know, to a certain extent, I think New York Botanical Garden perhaps roost the day that they did it, but it's such a signature thing. So for us who is not a botanical garden, we will make it more presentable and find some uses for it. And over time, maybe a section can be restored as a greenhouse, but it's born to really give the sense of what it was and how it was yeah. used. Yeah. Um, a question came in, can you bowl in the bowling alley and how do the bowling balls return to the top? Yes, so it, one can bowl in the bowling alley. It's, you know, we're not the Bowlmore Lane, so there's no shoe rental and, uh, you know, your fee for the lane. Um, on occasion at certain parties, um, you can do it, so if you, if you rent Lindhurst for a party, you can rent to have the bowling alley done. The way it works is that in the center between the two lanes, there is a gravity ball return. And at the very back, there's a padded pit and the ball boys would sit on top of the pit. <laughs> and you bowl, they'd pick up your ball out of the pit. They would put it in the gravity return. It would roll back to you. And then after you pull your two frames, they'd reset your pins by hand. And that's how it works. Oh, wow. And a lot of the, the estate bowling alleys were oftentimes done in basements of building. And they were sort of kind of glued to a cement floor. They just sat there. Um, the Lindhurst lanes are free floating. And they have holes all along the side that a screw jack can be put into so that they can be perfectly leveled. You know, as the weather changes, you're able to level them. And Brunswick came, I want to say 20 years ago, and re-leveled the lanes for us. So we don't use the original wood and, you know, uh, lignum vitae balls. We use, you know, balls from the 60s and pins from the 60s. And if you bowl a ball, it's, you, can, you can get a strike if you know what you're doing. <laughs> Sounds challenging. Yeah. Uh, we have a question. Will the laundry room be part of the tour? Was this building the main outbuilding for laundry for the entire estate? Yes. So we have a number of different tours we do. There's a main mansion tour. Also on Saturdays and Sundays, we have what's called the backstairs tour. So you can go up to the very top of the fifth floor tower. If the weather cooperates, um, you get a view of Manhattan down the river. Um, you get a fabulous view of the, you know, the new Mary Cuomo, formerly Tappan Zee Bridge, which is right, right below it. And of course, in October, if you hit it right, like come on, if you take that tour on a weekend when the leaves have changed, you'll get some spectacular photos from up there. That tour then takes you down the back stairs past the butler's bedroom and the butler's bathroom 
into the basement kitchen. So you see the cold storage rooms, the meat room, the main prep room, the uh, servants dining room. And then you go across um, to the basement of the laundry building where we have um, a laundry that was installed between about 1914 and 1920. And so you see all the original sinks, the original drying machines, the mangles, the electric irons, the early washer, all the laundry paraphernalia uh, that existed. It's very, you know, beautifully tiled, lovely, you know, light coming in there. You see the two rooms of the, the head female servant and one of the regular uh, female servants that were in that building. So that's the very end of that back stairs tour that you can book, which is separate from mansion tour. Um, and it's a very worthwhile tour. It's a really interesting view. For those of you who've watched Downton Abbey a lot, um, that's a worthwhile tour to take. Um, I will also just mention that some of you may know that Julian Fellows who developed Gilded, uh, the Downton Abbey show is doing an American series called The Gilded Age. And Lindhurst is one of the main, um, oh. um, you know, filming locations, but it's not in the way you would necessarily expect. We're we're Central Park. <laughs> um, our carriage house was turned into a printing shop. The mansion is one of the secondary characters. So, so you'll probably be seeing us on that when it airs in February. Oh, that'll be fun to look forward to. But we're yeah. getting close to the end of the hour. So we have one more question and then we'll let you go. Can Thank you tell you. us the type of trees that are on the estate, maples, oaks, lindens, and are they original? Yes, so we have very extensive numbers of trees. Um, and uh, I wanna say original is a bit of a relative thing. There are many trees that have survived um, from early iterations of the property. We've done some restoration to some of those. The earlier trees tend to be more American. So the elms that were there right at the entry are no longer there. We'll probably put those back in a few years, but there were what they called buttonwoods that were on. There were hornbeams. Um, there were chestnuts. And unfortunately, we've replaced where there were chestnuts with uh, a tree called a chinkapin oak, which has a chestnut-like leaf because chestnuts are you know, still subject to blight. Um, there are a lot of lindens which get put in in the 1860s and where the state gets its name because it was actually Lindenhurst, which got shortened to Lindhurst. Um, so there are a lot of those. There's also a lot of weeping beeches that we think were planted as mature trees in the mid 1920s and are gigantic today. Um, as well as copper beaches. We sadly, through storms and disease, lost as of last year, all of our huge copper beaches. We've replanted them. So sadly, they're not quite the size that they used to be, although you can see where they are and they're sort of, you know, about 12 feet high at this point. Um, there's also, the estate was really never planted with that many flowers, there is the Rose Garden. It really was intended to be a, a private central park. So we, between the shrubs and the trees, we flower from um, the forsythia in you know late March through mid-July when the rhododendron maximus flower and you've got um, native dogwoods, you have horse chestnuts, um, flowering the largest Japanese lilac you'll see anywhere, a variety of different hydrangeas, um, a lot of wygelia, dutsia, uh, spirea um, that flower. So one of the things that I would say about Lindhurst is a lot of the plants that we have are not necessarily, you know, sort of arboretum rare. Um, they represent really the American landscape taste from the 1840s through the 1960s um, and how that evolved. So a lot of the things like the Forsythia, Wygelia, Dutia, Hygrangea that we have that everybody just considers stuff that you can get from Home Depot, they were getting it from the countries of origin at the time. And what's interesting at Lindhurst is we have massive examples of uh, some of these trees. Um, so there's really good quality uh, 
in size. There are rarities, you know, the copper beaches are amazing. We've got one old camper down now and we've just planted another one. Uh, so for those of you who know trees, it's, it's surprising when you get there. A lot of people say that's the largest one of X that I've ever seen. Wow. Yeah. Well, we have come to the end of our hour and we cannot thank you enough for this really, really interesting program. And I think everyone will agree there's something to do at Lyndhurst every month of the year. There is, yeah. and we hope that people come. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing your time with us and we'll be down. Good, thank you for having okay. me. Okay, thanks, Howard. Good night, Bye -bye. everyone.